G'day mate, welcome back to Oxygenaut Included with me, JD. Today I decided, look, with a game called Oxygenaut Included, we should probably cover Oxygen. So, today we're going to really, really quickly cover Oxygen, just in case uh, you know, we cover something that you haven't seen before. Anyway, Oxygen's pretty easy actually, it, it's, it's probably one of the easier parts of the game. So, in the new final release, we actually have Oxyferns. Oxyferns are a completely new way for us to make oxygen for those experienced players. They require two things. So if they're out in the wild, they'll grow happily. You don't have to worry about them. That's nice and simple. If they're actually domesticated. So once we domesticate them, we have to give them four, four kilograms of dirt per cycle, along with 19 kilograms of water per cycle. If you throw these guys in a farm tile or a... Uh, planter box tile, you're going to have to have a duplicate come and physically put that water in that tile. Um, your other option is you can, if I just copy this, we can actually put them in hydroponic farm tiles. And if I just hook up a water feed into these tiles, as you can see, these guys have been activated again because they're receiving, uh, they're receiving water directly off a water pipe. So you can automate these guys a little bit. Um, in saying that, these actually do require carbon dioxide to operate. So you need to put them preferably somewhere low in your base where the carbon dioxide sits anyway to consume that carbon dioxide to output oxygen. Your second option we actually have is the first, one of the very first buildings we would actually build, which is a algae terrarium. Now, algae terrarium consumes algae and water at 300 grams per cycle, so a lot less than your oxy ferns, and they actually output 40 grams per second of oxygen, and most of the... Um, water they've taken in as clean water they actually output as polluted water so you do have an option there to reclaim a lot of the water that you are expending into the system and with a water sieve you can actually convert that polluted water back into clean water to potentially feed it back into this system um, so they can be very very effective to use now there are a couple other things i do want to note about these guys the polluted water the duplicates do require manual labor to remove the polluted water out of these guys so when they fill up with polluted water a duplicate has got to come over here plunge them pull the polluted water out and dump it on the floor as you can see i've had these guys running for a little while we've got a lot of polluted water st st sat down here they are out off gassing a lot of polluted, uh, polluted oxygen at this stage so each one of these bottles of where are we polluted water so i've got 300 kilograms here and it's off gassing 8.7 grams per second it's not a lot but it is something that some players don't actually like in their base to counteract that we can actually put in a couple of deodorizers like that um, once these guys have been filled up with some sand which hopefully duplicate comes and does straight away yep we've got Mima and Ren uh, coming and adding those right away and that'll actually consume that <sighs> Gossman did you have to fart during a video shish these deodorizers, whoop. How much you got in there? No, you got plenty. So... Yeah, you got plenty in there. Uh, there we go. Oh, it flashed off for half a second. Uh, trying to catch these things in the act can be a little bit difficult. Come on. There we go. So, we are consuming our uh, filtration medium. So, our filtration medium is either sand or regolith they are the two filtration mediums available in the game they're going to actually consume the polluted oxygen uh in at like you know 66 percent or 66 grams per second and they're going to give you back 60 grams of that polluted oxygen as clean oxygen again and also convert some of that filtration medium into actual clay so clay is one of those items that we do use later in the game to make ceramic pipes so it's not a bad trade overall. On top of that, we can automate these algae terrariums a little bit. As you can see, they need 300 grams per second of water. If I calculate, I've got eight of them right here. 300 times uh, eight oh, means they need 2,400 grams per second of water. If I actually have a liquid valve here and I connect it to a... Uh, I hook a liquid valve up into my main pipe and then have it drip on the floor. You can see that this guy down here needs two or has 225 grams of uh, kilograms of water. And we should see this number going up. It is slowly going up because what we're actually doing is dripping that water on the floor 
and each one of these plants are actually consuming that water. So I now don't have to have Giblets come deliver that water to this system. Um, they're still going to obviously have to come along and plunge the plants to get rid of the, blue, uh, the polluted water. And they're going to have to take that polluted water elsewhere to actually pump it out. But it is a start to automating this whole process. On top of that, there's a little hidden feature that if we... Put in a ceiling light... Right about there. Uh, and hook that up to some power. So these guys are outputting 30 grams per second. Once they're hit with light, they should go up to 33 grams per second. Uh, yeah, that's definitely enough light. Ah, there we go. So we're emitting 44, to 44 grams per second of oxygen. Uh, so we went from the 40 grams we were getting, we're actually getting an extra 10% oxygen out of these guys just because they're under a little bit of light. So if you've got some shine bugs floating around your base or you want to put some lamps around your base, these can, you can up their efficiency just a little bit, which does add up over time by just putting a light above them. The next uh, couple of options we actually have for oxygen are more, well, this is really our first set of man-made ones. So, or dupe-made ones, technically. So, we have the oxygen diffuser. The oxygen dif diffuser has been around since really at the start of the game. And these guys, again, take in algae. So, it is using a potential finite resource in the game, along with 120 watts worth of power per second to give you 500 grams per second of oxygen with a touch of heat. Like the heat is so lo low that we can pretty much ignore it. Um, the one thing you are have, uh, you, you do have to be considerate of is these guys are going to output their oxygen at 30 degrees. The algae uh, terrarium is also going to output oxygen at 30 degrees. So these guys will keep your base fairly cold. The next ones we're going through the list are actually going to start outputting very, very hot oxygen, which is something you're going to have to deal with sooner or later. So um, as I said, consumes algae, outputs oxygen, does not deal with the carbon dioxide at all. So this is really the point where now we're starting to use different man-made or dupe-made materials uh, and, and, and technology that we're going to have to find some way to deal with that carbon dioxide. The next one on the list is our rust, uh, Rusty Oxidizer. So the Rusty Oxidizer takes in 750 grams per second of, uh, of rust and rust and 250 grams per second of salt. Takes in a little bit of power, 60 watts as well. And it's going to actually output 570 grams worth of oxygen at that 75 degree temperature, along with 30 grams per second of chlorine. So chlorine is another gas that we're going to have to find some way to deal with, um, with this particular system. Um, along with that, it puts out a little bit of heat, but it's also dumping 400 grams per second of iron ore on that on the ground. Now, if I bring up the heat overlay, we can see these guys are pretty good. These guys are pretty good. These guys are a little bit warmer. This guy's really warm. Uh, mainly because he's got 300 kilograms worth of hot iron ore that he's dumped on the ground that I haven't had the dupes sweep up because intentionally I want to keep that in the... Well, for this particular video, I want to keep it in the same area so you guys can see that it's going to heat things up sooner or later. Um, that iron ore has... A certain amount of specific heat capacity, um, which is inherent in that item, which you need to deal with somewhere or another. Um, as for the chlorine itself, what I've actually put underneath, so I've built this on a couple of airflow tiles, I've actually put some salt, uh, dash of salt vines underneath. So the dash of salt vines actually consume chlorine. So as you can see, I do have just a little bit of chlorine down here. And these two little guys here are quite happily eating up that, that chlorine just because this is in a, a little bit of a pit where chlorine's a heavier gas. It's going to flow down. The oxygen is going to flow up. Um, unfortunately, I do have carbon dioxide stuck at the bottom. So maybe you want to put an algae terrarium down here just to make sure that that carbon dioxide does get soaked up so the chlorine still has somewhere to go. Um, but yeah, the dash of salt vines are quite happily eating that chlorine. They're also eating just a little bit of sand, not a lot. Um, and they're actually going to give us back some salt. Now that salt, don't forget, does get used in the rust, rust deoxidizer. So you do have a somewhat little symbiotic relationship here. Um, our next real oxygen maker is the electrolyzer. Now the electrolyzer is... It's really the workhorse of most uh, bases. So it takes in water and power and it gives you oxygen and hydrogen and a fair bit amount of heat you have to deal with. Mainly because that oxygen is going to come out at 70 degrees, same as the hydrogen. 
and you're going to be producing a lot of oxygen by the time you normally get up to electrolyzers because you've gone past that three, four, five dupe starting point. You're now probably at the, for most bases, 10 plus, um, especially if you get up to larger bases at like 20 or 30 dupes. It's a lot of heat you're going to have to find somewhere to deal with. So, um, the electrolyzer, as it outputs the, the two byproducts, uh, oxygen and hydrogen. And what I've actually got here is there's lots of different systems for how to do a, a self-powered oxygen maker. Make it a SPOM or a self propelled oxygen maker. Um, there's been lots of different names for it over the last two years, but basically, I'm going to show two quick designs. I, I, I'm there is lots and lots of different answers to this problem all over the internet. There's we've had two, two years of, of creatively making these things. Um, honestly, I'm not going to give you a perfect build, I'm going to give you some ideas, then leave it up to you guys to go out and see what you can come up with. So the electrolyzer, as it outputs two items, oxygen and hydrogen. Hydrogen is a lighter gas, oxygen is a heavier gas. So what I've actually built here is I've built a little bit of a tank. I actually have a, a special void item down here. It's basically sucking up all the oxygen because I was slightly over pressured outside the base and this was not working terribly well. Um, and where are we? Back to our gas overlay. So the oxygen is sort of flowing out the bottom. The hydrogen being the lighter gas is flowing up to the top. Up here, I've got a little bit of a chimney set up here. So we're pushing that hydrogen up and at the same time, making sure that the gas pump is at the highest part in the uh, tube. Obviously, the longer this chimney is, the more effective it is at compressing and forcing that hydrogen all together. Um, and then what I actually have is, I've, I've got two options for you. So you can run the uh, hydrogen, or you can suck up the hydrogen, run it into a proper gas filter. So in a proper gas filter, I'm sorting out the hydrogen, uh, running it out the orange pipe, into a storage tank, into a hydrogen generator, and whatever's not hydrogen is passing out this green one, which should obviously be oxygen, hopefully, and running it down here and dumping it back into this room, because really that's where I want the oxygen to go. Um, on top of that, I, I've done a gas element sensor. Realistically, you can just use a pressure sensor, just something so this gas pump's not running all the time, because really you, you're looking for the natural confection at, natural convection of the air to force the oxygen down the hydrogen up if you've obviously got a, a pseudo vacuum up here caused by that gas pump it's going to pull all the gases up sooner or later which is going to cause you to suck up a lot of oxygen making meaning this pump's running more often co costing you power this gas filter is running more often costing you power and so far as you can see i've actually filled this gas reservoir I have a battery full, I have a transformer full, and I have a hydrogen generator. It's taking a little bit of damage because I didn't have the gas filter in there originally. But this system by itself is running beautifully with not really using any power whatsoever. So, going through the actual power overlay, um, we should do that really, really quickly. So I have, actually, let's go automation. So the automation is a uh, hydro sensor, uh, no, a gas, gas element sensor. So I'm just detecting that I, I have hydrogen at this point in my chimney and with a bit of automation I've actually got a filter gate here saying hey if I have a green signal from this side guy saying hey I've found hydrogen and it stays green for 30 seconds I want to make sure it's not just one drop of hydrogen it's actually there is hydrogen filled up to this section then we're gonna actually turn on the gas pump which is obviously gonna suck that hydrogen up um, as you can see the pressure down here is 600 Pressure up here is 300 and dropping because we're sucking the hydrogen up further. Um, just to run it into my uh, filter, into my tank, and then off to the rest of the system. You know, as you can see, this is stopped pumping already because we found a, a little bit of oxygen got there and turned the whole system off. So, um, there you go, we sucked up just a tiny bit of oxygen. So, if I made a longer chimney, this might work with a little bit less, well, a little bit less gas filter, a little bit more of just. We're going to rely on the automation. Anyway, back to the power overlay. So power overlay, I... Automation overlay. Automation overlay, I have a smart battery here set up to say, hey, at 80% power in the battery, turn this guy uh, turn off the generator. At 50% power uh, in the battery, turn the, go, uh, turn the generator back on. I've also got up a power transformer. Now, the reason I've actually got a power transformer is just because of how a power is grabbed out of the circuit when it comes to oxygen not included. So a power transformer actually has first pick at any power that's made by any generator. So I want to actually make sure that 
the power transformer gets the first bit of power, comes over here and actually powers this system up. This is going to be really, really important because obviously if we don't have power going to the electrolyzer and the gas pump and the gas filter, we're not going to have any hydrogen. If we don't have any hydrogen, the um, hydrogen generator is not going to run. We're not going to have any more power to run the system. So I want to make sure the power has come here first. If you're worried at all, you can add an extra battery to this system. So you actually have a battery on this side as well as a battery on that side of the system. Um, just a normal battery will do. And as for the rest of the power, I'm just fitting it out into my main grid. So this guy is actually powering up my light I just added, plus my other oxygen makers and even the pump to bring the water up into this system. This guy is fully self-powered and you can see that I have 150 kilograms worth of hydrogen here, plus all the pipes are full. Um, and I've done zigzag pipes just to get a little bit more storage out of my pipes. Um, so yeah, this system is completely full. We've created a lot of power. We've got a lot of excess power out of this system, ready to use elsewhere in our base. Um, all you do is hook up this, this main outgoing line to your main power grid. Um, over here, I have like a slightly different version, or well, a different version of, again, a self-powered oxygen maker. Um, we have gas overlay. So we have a hydrogen pump up here. I'm sort of exploiting um, the fact that only one material can op uh, occupy one tile at a time. So up here, I actually have hydrogen up here and I've actually sucked the hydrogen all the way down to fill up this whole room um, just by running this pump continuously until this whole section was full of hydrogen. Um, reason I've actually done that is I don't want any oxygen coming over here. I don't want this guy to ever have to see oxygen or deal with oxygen. Meanwhile, because oxygen is the heavier gas, it's coming down here. This gas pump's picking up perfectly, venting it out here. And I've, again, I've got one of those little voids in there. So any gas we pump in this room just gets deleted instantly. Uh, I do have a tiny bit of automation. Again, I just got an automation to say, hey, if the pressure up here is above 700 grams worth of hydrogen, I want you to turn on. Down here, uh, same story, if it's above 700 grams of oxygen, you could even set this lower, right? You just want to make sure you have some sort of pressure differential between the two, because you don't want either of these two gas pumps accidentally pulling a vacuum. Um, obviously, the lower that you have these numbers, so if I set this down at 500, and this also down to 500, the more often this electrolyzer is going to run. Because it outputs... Uh, because it outputs 888 grams per second, that is technically enough for 8.8 .8 dupes if you maintain 100% uptime. Getting 100% uptime is going to be very, very difficult. Um, on top of that, it because it's outputting 800 grams per second of oxygen, our gas pumps themselves only actually use five. Oh, I can only pump 500 grams per second of oxygen. So ideally, in a system like this, I should really have two gas pumps if I want to have better uptime out of this. Um, so I could make sure I pulled all the oxygen out. This is really like a little baby setup. It's only really, you know, like I said, I'm giving you guys ideas. You can take, then take these ideas and run with it. You could have one electrolyzer, two gas pumps pulling out oxygen, one pulling, pulling out hydrogen. You go back to a system like this, which I've built in the past where I had five electrolyzers, a very, very long chimney and one gas pump at the top because, oh, wrong one. Uh, five times lots of five electrolyzers doing hydrogen. It's about 500 grams per second. I could possibly keep a pump running non-stop. There's lots and lots of different options when it comes to these sorts of machines. So I normally recommend to yourself, recommend to you guys play with them, have a bit of a design, think about how things are going to work. Oxygen Oxygenoclid is really a game about many, many different solutions to the exact same problem. Um, as for this particular build here, I've actually built it with doors because it's just quicker and easier to get the duplicates in, build everything, get them out, and then remove access from the doors so they can't come up back in here and ruin the gases. Um, power system, actually automation. Automation is just those two Atmos sensors hooked up to the two gas pumps. Again, hydrogen generator hooked up to a smart battery. Power, pretty much the same thing. I'm bringing power out to the main grid, adding to my battery, and then coming down here and powering a tr power transformer, which is then powering the critical power parts in here before powering anything else. Um, as you can see, this guy over here did take some damage, and we saw a little bit of oxygen get passed through the filter and, and pumped back out. This guy has been running for uh, however long. 
um, has not had an issue. Um, his, because the way I've actually set up the smart batteries, this guy's basically powering the whole network with this guy kicking in occasionally when help is needed. But yeah, these systems, they're, they're, as it, they're referred to as a self-powering oxygen maker. They're very, very powerful, but you are going to have some heat that you need to deal with. Um, this has been running for a while. This has been running for a while. You can see things are starting to get a little bit warm. Uh, lastly, we have the carbon dioxide we spoke about before. So carbon dioxide, really the only way to deal with it is with a carbon skimmer. And I've actually got a nice bright red corner down here that Abe's about to suffocate in. Dude, just run. Pick a direction. Go for it. So, um, I actually have a scalp carbon skimmer down here. Uh, what a carbon skimmer does is it takes in one kilogram per second of water and also consumes 300 grams per second of carbon dioxide. It also takes in 120 watts worth of power. Now, output wise, every bit of water you just put into it is coming straight back out of it. You don't actually have any loss in water. You do have a little bit of heat added back into the system, but then again, it's eating your carbon dioxide, so you can't really argue with how it works. Um, the only other thing you need to really hook to make these systems work is you need a water sieve. So a water sieve is going to take in uh, polluted water, no, polluted water, five kilograms per second. So enough to run five of these machines or a couple of bathrooms plus this machine, lots of different options. Uh, and 120 watts per, uh, 120 watts worth of power, along with some filtration medium. As I already covered, the filtration medium is sand, regolith, uh, sand, most maps have some sand, or at least a decent supply of man sand. And if you ever run out, just dig to the top of the map. The whole top of the map is covered in regolith. And every new asteroid, or every new meteorite hitting your asteroid, is going to bring you a fresh dose of regolith. So it's not something you're probably ever going to run out of. Um, and it's going to take our up to 5 kilograms of polluted water and give us back 5 kilograms worth of clean water. It's also going to give us a little bit of polluted dirt and a little bit of heat back in the system. So what I actually have down here is just a loop. So I've taken the clean water, fed it into the system, take the polluted water out, fit it into the water sieve, and straight back to the system. And if I just undisable this guy, we can see the water's flowing out, water's flowing in. And we'll even uh, just empty a couple of pipes so we can see it a little bit better. Empty a couple more pipes. There we go. So... We can see that yeah, water flows out, water flows in. Very, 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 very simple system. And if I just turn on this overlay and we hit it, hit super speed, I do have 40 dupes breathing out, don't forget. But you can see this is being fairly effective already at bringing this corner of death back in towards that machine. Um, each time these tiles go light, that basically means it's making a vacuum. It has sucked out all the carbon dioxide in this area. So... Very, very effective machine at removing carbon dioxide. You know, what was that? Half a cycle or so. And it ate that corner's worth at 300, 500 grams. 500 grams worth of carbon dioxide just gone very, very quickly. Anyway, with that said, that's where I'm going to end this video. As always, if you like the video, you found it informative, by all means, click the like button. <sighs> yeah, there's obviously emergency services driving past the front of the house. Anyway, like I said, if you like the video, click the like button by all means. If you really enjoyed the video, uh, click, share it with your friends. I would appreciate it. YouTube algorithm would appreciate it. We'd all appreciate it. Same story. If you want to see more tutorials like this, more helpful videos like this, by all means, me, by all means, click the subscribe button. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye.